Greetings and welcome to a tutorial that is going to help us organize the ideas related to the immune system. I'm a big fan of flowcharts. I really like to organize information in a kind of top-down fashion in order to help my brain coordinate all of the information and begin to start using the information. So to begin off, we're going to move to my next slide, which is going to be a picture of me and a whiteboard. And we are going to begin addressing the components of the immune system so that we can see how they're kind of organized, what sort of things they do will be discussed, but not necessarily included in the chart. I think this is probably going to be a three-part tutorial, so you'll get the introductory information in part one, as well as information with the first line of defense, and then we'll move to a second tutorial that will continue to build the flowchart by discussing the second line of defense, and then a third tutorial that will look at the third line of defense. So let's get started. Okay, hi. So behind me I have the whiteboard and up at the very top I have the immune system and I've got the immune system as my kind of broad over encompassing uh, piece of information. And within the immune system we have two major divisions that are going to play key roles in what will take place in the immune system. So the two divisions are the first line of defense, sorry, the first two are the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So immune system is divided into two categories. I'm gonna have two lines here. I'm gonna put my innate on the left, and then I'm gonna use a different color for the adaptive just to help my brain recognize that they do different things. So the innate immune system is something that you're born with. You come with all of these pieces, and it tends to be very generalized in its response as it attempts to keep you safe from viruses, bacteria, fungus, etc. The adaptive immune system is going to be a little more specific. So its goal is to remember the specific disease that you've had previously, like chicken pox or maybe that nasty head cold that you carried around last winter. There are some alternative names for these that you might find being used. The innate immune system is also known as the non-specific immune system. And the adapted immune system is also known as the specific immune system. That probably has something to do with the fact that the specific immune system is targeting specific types of diseases like measles, or chickenpox, head cold, or influenza, whereas the nonspecific is simply designed to keep anything that's foreign out of your body and to help preserve your health. Now, one more piece of information I'm going to toss up here. We often talk about immunity when it comes to the immune system, and it's very common student misconception that everything here is part of immunity, but in fact, the first line of defense and second line of defense that our components of the innate immune system do nothing for immunity. They aren't going to remember a specific microbe. They're going to be a very generalized type of response. So it is the adaptive immune system from which we get immunity. Immunity implies a specific response to a type of disease. So it's going to be important for us to recognize as we're going through our material that that immunity is going to be very specialized. Okay, so now that we have that kind of out of the way, we're going to start using some additional colors to outline our three lines of defense. Now, I like to use color to help organize my ideas in my brain. I'm gonna use the same colors here. So I'm gonna start with green, and I'm gonna use that for my first line of defense, which is one of the divisions of the innate immune system. I also am going to have a second line of defense. So I'm going to use purple to indicate my second line of defense. And then I have a third line of defense, and that third line of defense is something that is specific to the adaptive immune system. So it's going to come over here. I'm going to use a third color to help my brain keep these ideas organized. Now, 
We're going to take a quick moment to talk about lines of defense. Okay. Now, each one of these is going to require slightly more investment energy-wise by the body. Some of them are going to be external and relatively cheap. Some of them are going to be internal and relatively expensive when it comes to energy and the amount of time it takes to produce and raise up or rear these particular things. So I like to use an analogy, and I'm getting to the point where not everybody has seen Braveheart. I'm going to use a movie analogy. Um, yeah, so I'm starting to age a little bit. Those of you who have seen Braveheart, excellent. For those of you who have not seen Braveheart, add in any medieval movie where you've got a bunch of guys lined up on opposite sides of a field trying to kill each other. So when we're looking at the way that the militaries or these armies would organize themselves, we found that there are three different types of individuals that would be a part of this. We have the foot soldiers, and typically foot soldiers had very little training. In fact, it was not uncommon for the peasants to be taken out of the field, hauled off to war, and a sword slapped in their hand. They were put right out in front, so they took the brunt of the physical combat with very little training whatsoever. Beyond that, we have the archers, and the archers took a little more training. So typically this is somebody who spent some time learning how to handle a bow and an arrow, how to shoot very specifically, and the archers were typically lined up behind the foot sarge foot soldiers and told to release arrows at specific time periods. The third component of the army was the cavalry, and the cavalry was certainly expensive when you look at the time and the investment. You had to raise a horse that had to be at least two or three years before training, probably more likely five or six before it was able to carry all of the heavy weaponry. There's all the training that goes into the horse, but then you gotta get a guy to ride the horse, so the guy has to learn how to ride the horse, but he's gotta learn how to ride the horse with all of the armor and miscellaneous stuff, wielding a sword, and being effective. So there's a lot of time investment in that particular. The armies were lined up so that the ones that were least trained were right out front and more likely to be killed. You didn't wanna send your cavalry in first because if you lost all your cavalry, you lost all that training. Your lines of defense and your immune system mirror this type of organization. So the first line of defense tends to be the really cheap stuff. These are the foot soldiers. The second line of defense are your archers. And your third line of defense is going to be the cavalry. That's going to be the third line over here. Okay, now that we have that basic schematic, we're going to start filling out components of each one of these. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to start talking about the first line of defense. And one of the things that always confused me was what were the parts and what were the parts supposed to do and sort of responses. And then there were these chemical things that were going back and forth. And so we're going to create a chart that's going to include three categories. For each one of these lines of defense, we're going to have a cell category. We're going to have a response category, and then we're going to have a chemical category, because cells largely communicate with each other through chemical signals, sometimes electrical, but largely chemical signals. And so this is going to give us just a little bit of a framework to help us begin to understand how the cells are working together. When you think of large structures external to the body that are going to be important and helpful in protecting you, one of the first things you should come across is the idea of the skin. The skin is the largest organ that you have in your body. Doctors spend the majority of their time when you're in an appointment assessing your skin. It tells us quite a lot about the health of the body. It's going to help keep things out and keep other things in. Now, the other large structure that's cellular that tends to be a primary cellular component of the first line of defense is a mucous membrane. Now, you're going to stop here and you're going to say, wait a minute, Nicole, the mucous membrane's on the inside, you're not fooling me. But we have to consider one thing here. When you were born, you have a mouth and you have an anus. And everything that is environmental should be in direct contact with the air around you. So it's easy to see how the skin would be a barrier between the environment. But if you think about it, all the way from your mouth to your anus, you are connected to the outside environment. And everything that you bring in through your mouth 
has to go down this tube. And if you don't absorb it or internalize it, if it isn't brought across that tube and inside the body, it gets eliminated out of that external orifice. That anus is going to release it out of uh, the, the contents of the rectum out. So not only is the skin external to the body, but the mucous membranes that line the respiratory tract, the nasal passage, or anywhere in the GI tract also get to be considered part of the external environment. So we have both skin and mucous membranes that are cellular structures that are designed to keep things from the external environment from coming in. Now, I like to add two other structures. Their primary purpose in no means is the immune system, but they add some benefit to the immune system. One is hair. I think hair plays a pretty significant role in assisting to keep things out of the eyes. For example, your eyelashes are designed to catch things so it doesn't fall into your eyes. Your nasal passage is loaded with hairs that design that are designed as a filter to help filter out anything that you're inhaling. So this is certainly going to have some elements and assist our immune system. The other thing I'd like to put up here are nails. Nails also are going to be found on uh, your fingertips. They're going to be found on your toenails, and they also seem to be pretty important in high-use areas and helping protect those high-use areas by adding a little more structural support, something that's a little stronger. So those are the four things that I included in my cellular first line of defense. Now we're going to start looking at what sort of responses the first line of defense can elicit to help keep things from penetrating into the body. One of the first things that we're going to put up here is sweating. Now, sweating is probably largely to, going to have an impact with the idea of overheating. But if we start considering the fact that we have insensible perspiration, that you're constantly perspiring a little bit, and that helps keep the skin moist, that's going to help assist organisms. Um, that's going to help. That's going to help the skin stay moist, which is going to facilitate that cellular barrier. But in addition, if you are sweating, you can take microbes that are on the surface of the skin and wash them off, or even bathe them in a salty solution, which is going to affect osmotic gradients. Other things that we would consider as a first line of defense response. If something goes in your nose, it probably ought to come out. So we have to include both sneezing as well as coughing. Both of those are designed to blow things right back out that are trying to get deep inside the body. Now, have you ever gotten something in your eye, large or otherwise, and it causes profuse watering? So we're going to stick crying up here as a response as well, because the idea with the increased tear production is to help get that fluid across the eye and help get whatever's in the eye out of the eye. Now, I've got three more that I'm going to add up here. The first one is vomiting. If something goes in your stomach that doesn't belong, you're going to vomit it back out. Now, if it gets past the stomach and it ends up in the intestines, we're going to see it blow out the other end. So we can have diarrhea. And then lastly, we're also going to put urination up here. Now, urination, its goal, its objective, its purpose has very little to do with the immune system. But if we consider patients that are in a hospital setting or somebody who's prone to urinary tract infections, one of the things that we recommend to those patients is that they go to the bathroom more frequently. So by urinating frequently, we can flush the urethra and shorter urethras are more likely to develop urinary tract infections. And so by simply urinating more often, we tend to be washing out that urethra and washing out any microbes that may be trying to penetrate the urethra and gain a foothold in the bladder for causing infection. So urination is definitely not a key component of the immune system but yet it serves some functions to assist there. Okay, so if we look at the chemicals that are related to the first line of defense, we're gonna find that sweating, as well as the microbes on your skin are going to help create an acid mantle. And that acid mantle is simply going to detour any microbes that are trying to gain a foothold or persist within or on your body. 
A mucous membrane is probably going to produce mucus. And mucus, as you know, is going to be sticky. It's going to help get things out. Everybody who's had a head cold or some sort of infection of the respiratory system probably has a fair amount of experience with mucus. In the oral cavity, we have saliva. In the eyes, we have tears. And we also have things like earwax to help get things out. Now, one of the interesting things about tears, saliva, and mucus is that they all can have antibodies in them. And those antibodies are gonna help remove or kill or damage microbes that are trying to penetrate. They're not specific to a type of, of organism, like it's not for head cold virus, it's against viruses as a generality. Okay, other things we wanna include up here. Um, we probably could include sweat as a component of the acid mantle. Depending on your textbook, it might discuss that in slightly varying methods. And then if we're looking at vomiting, we also should then recognize that the stomach is extremely acidic, and that acid also detours growth of organisms. So we have that available to help protect the body as well. Um, Mucous membranes, saliva, and tears, they can have lysozymes in them, and lysozymes are chemicals that are produced by cells to help eliminate um, oh, anything that is trying to penetrate the body again. As a broad category, so it's digesting any foreign cell or any virus particle that's trying to penetrate the body. Okay, so that's my first line of defense. I've got my cells, I've got the responses, and then I also have the chemicals that are gonna be present to try to keep us healthy.